Um, I'd first like to welcome and thank all of you for giving up your time to be with us today, wherever you are in the world. If you like, please add where you're from, your role, and a place in the world you'd love to be able to travel to in the chat box so we can get to know each other a bit better. Uh, personally, I would love to go back to the Philippines to visit my relatives. Now tonight our presenters come from all around Australia, America, and even Simon from London. If you're sitting in your office, cooking dinner, or walking your dog right now, I hope you find tonight at least a little inspiring. Um, I'd love to give a quick shout out to my John Purchase Public School family who are supporting me tonight and who always support, uh, empower me to be better every day. Our presenters, I'd love if you could turn your cameras on so we could just, they could see your smiley faces. Thank you. Um, if you're on Twitter, please share your reflections using the hashtag TeachMeetEmpowerThem or TM empower them. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. And if our presenters stick to their seven minutes, which they promised me they would, um, that should leave us with about 10 minutes for some Q&A at the end. So I'm lucky to be an executive member of the Australian Curriculum Studies Association. And I'd like to thank them for this opportunity to facilitate the Teach Meet tonight. At the moment, they're running a series of webinars facilitated by the authors of the book, Flip the System Australia. And I highly encourage you to check it out if you are into empowering teachers and teacher agency. I feel privileged to say that the speakers we're about to hear from tonight have all empowered me in some way. They've empowered me to become a better educator, a better leader, and even just a better person. These are people who are truly making a change in education, while somehow always remaining grounded and focused on our purpose, which is to help our students to become better learners and help them find within themselves how they can make a difference in the world. So first up, I'd love to introduce Victoria Brownlee all the way from America. It's 3 a.m. over there and she is looking amazing. Um, she's an independent education consultant and the owner of an impact coaching company, Creating From Within. The title of her presentation is Teaching With Intention. So please welcome Victoria. Thank you for that introduction. Good evening or good morning, regardless of where you are in the world, greetings. There's not one way to empower teachers and empower students, but I'm going to share three personal examples of teaching with intention and how that empowers students and teachers. The definition of intention is a thing intended, an aim, a plan, aim, an aim moving towards a plan or a goal. When we teach with intention, we empower others. I will never forget my fifth grade teacher. And one day she approached me and she said, Victoria, I'm organizing a parent night and I want you to sing a solo. Well, at the time in fifth grade, I was an introvert. Now ask my friends today, they would tell you I'm an extrovert, but at that time I was extremely shy. I wouldn't share my voice. So when she asked me to sing a solo, you could imagine I was mortified. She noticed the fear on my face and she said, Victoria, don't worry, we are going to do this together. I'm gonna to ask your parents, can I take you to singing lessons on the weekend? And we're gonna to work together. I'm gonna to make sure you're ready for this day. Well, fast forward a few months later, I found myself up in front of a group of parents singing my heart out, feeling confident, feeling empowered. Now don't ask me to sing anything tonight, but I am still sharing my voice. It's just in a different way. What did that teacher do? She set the intention to impact others. And that is my first point, set the intention to impact others. Just like my teacher did, she gave me a voice. She noticed an area of growth within me and curated an experience to make it a strength. And all the students in that class had a role in that program. Everybody was impacted by her plan. And as educators, we can create those plans to impact others, amplify those areas of growth in students and in teachers, and, and organize experiences that turn them into strengths. My next point, 
set an intention to empower others. One day I was coaching a teacher and she confided in me. She said, Victoria, I'm unhappy. I don't feel like I get the support that I need from the leadership. I don't feel like I'm growing and thriving. And I dread every day that I walk into that school building. In that moment, I, I challenged her. I asked her to set an intention to empower yourself. We created a plan. A part of that plan, I had her write down all the characteristics of the leader you wanna see. And some of those characteristics were authentic, active listener, leading with compassion, and a co-creator. I told her, I said, every day you walk into that building, show up as that. Be the change you wanna see. Be the leader you wanna experience. When you're interacting with your students, show up with compassion. When you're talking to your colleagues, actively listen to them. Co-create lesson plans with them. And she did that. Some time passed and she called me again. She said, Victoria, you won't believe it. My principal asked me to take on a leadership role. She set the intention to empower herself first and that had an impact on her leader. She didn't have to say anything to him. Not only did it empower her, but it also empowered her students. She said her students were more confident. She said they were more joyful. They were more willing to engage in the classroom community. And she reported experience and more joy. When students are, when teachers are empowered, students feel empowered. Students experience more joy. My last point, set an intention to build a joyful community. Albert Einstein once said, it is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. Students thrive in joyful communities. Teachers thrive in joyful communities. And leaders thrive in joyful communities. According to some research done by John Banus, a professor here in the States, he found that appropriate humor, appropriate humor in the classroom positively impacts the learning environment. When students experience joy in the classroom and joyful environments, they reported, students, teachers, and leaders, they all reported feeling safe, safe to be vulnerable in the environment. They were more confident they were more motivated to engage in the classroom community. They were encouraged to be innovative. They were empowered to take initiative. And they even felt safe when they weren't having good days because they, were, they felt like they had a purpose. They felt like they belonged, just like the students in that teacher's classroom that I was working with and just like she experienced more joy. They flourished, they thrived they felt empowered. As educators, our intentionality empowers others. We create a plan to empower others. The three points I made tonight, set an intention to impact others, set an intention to empower yourself, be the change you want to see, be the leader you want to see, be the educator you want to see, be the student you want to see. Set an intention to build a joyful community. Your smile is contagious. Your joy is contagious. Students need teachers who believe in them, empower them to discover and follow their dreams, just like my teacher did. I gave you three examples. But how are you going to teach and lead with intention, ultimately empowering others? Thank you. Wow, Victoria, what a way to start our teach meet. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story with, uh, story with us about how you were empowered um, by your teacher as a student because she set the intention to impact others. I think um, from experience working with you as my coach as well, you definitely have a gift for empowering others. Like you really help us to visualize how we want to be, how the best version of ourselves at work in life. 
which obviously has a positive impact on students. So thank you for being you doing the story tonight. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, thank you. Next we have Stephen Colbert. He's a literacy improvement teacher and learning specialist pedagogy at Brunswick Secondary College. The title of his presentation is Empowering Teachers and Activists Act. Oh, alliteration. <laughs> It wasn't, wasn't too confident on that title, but anyway, we, we did what we did. Um, I'm going to start a seven minute timer for my own benefit, otherwise I'll overspeak. Um, so my name's Stephen Culver. I talk about these sort of things. Uh, Teachers Across Borders Australia, we used to run professional development to upskill Cambodian teachers. We'd take a whole bunch of teachers from Australia, the US and whoever would volunteer. Obviously that's not currently the case, hence the, you know, it would be nice to go back to Cambodia. Edu Reading is an academic reading group I want run and excitingly empowering teachers and democratizing schooling is a book that I'm co-editing with Keith Hegger and Springer uh, and Steffi will be writing one of the chapters so I'm very excited for that especially um, and so as a result I'm just kind of sort of waffling off some ideas that sort of loosely relate to the title of the book uh, as it's you know in the draft phase I should mention AXE is currently running, A-C-S-A that is, uh, I don't want to make it sound too Aussie, is currently running a series on Put the System Australia. And the book that we're working on is deeply uh, influenced by that. I would say that book changed my life. Uh, and so I strongly recommend people check out those webinars if they, uh, if they haven't or if they're interested. And so the basic concept of those books was we need to flip the system, the teachers need to lead and be involved in policy and all those sort of things. And so the position of the book that we're putting together is basically that to get that to happen, we need to empower teachers. So very suitable to come after Victoria and from one introvert to another. Um, I strongly agree with the idea that someone asking you to speak as I'm currently doing now uh, is in and of itself an empowering act. So, and of course, we should always start with the students. What about the students? Um, and to me, I think, and this might be, you know, because I've been teaching for 11 years or a middle career, I'm having a midlife crisis or something like that. But uh, I think the amount of impact you can have with a class of 25 students uh, is magnified with that, that you can have with 25 teachers. So as much as possible, I always try to, if you decide to improve the teachers, you'll inevitably improve a large number of students as well. And that's um, also what we aim to do in our, in our work in Cambodia impacting the teachers, uh, modernizing their pedagogy, whatever that means, uh, and upskilling them had a knock on effect to the whole sway of Cambodian Khmer students. So lead so they may follow. Um, I think it's really important for us as teachers to show our professionalism to our students. Um, you know, it's perfectly acceptable to miss classes at points, to go to a meeting and, and actually be able to explain, I was uh, you know, speaking on behalf of the profession at XYZ and have them see that you know it's not just you don't just tend to speak to small groups of 25 students but that you have perhaps a larger impact beyond that and I think that's important for young people to see. Uh, so building strong leader like teachers this is, this is the hard part and I'm glad that on the agenda tonight we've got lots of people talking about coaching because that to me is how you turn someone from you know someone who just reacts to situations to someone who is a leader who innovates and takes risks and chances. And so we've already heard that from Steffi and Victoria in their coaching relationship uh, that they discussed earlier. So knowing our enemies, this sounds pretty dangerous, but I think basically neoliberalism econo and an economic view of education is our enemy. And the way that we halt that is treating ourselves and others as professionals, getting, getting us into groups as much as possible, doing what we're doing now, sharing our expertise for free and discussing leading conversations and making spaces where teachers are heard uh, is the best way to counter that. So it's not as dramatic as it sounds. Building democ democracy within our classrooms is key. And again, to do that, you have to be empowered in your own self. You have to feel as though your voice is important, both within your classroom and without. And so to, d to get democracy happening in your own classroom, that basically means that you're taking a back step in some respects and letting your students lead things, letting them have voice choice and agency as the classic triptych goes. And so to do that, you need to also try and bring about what we're doing here as well, bring about democratic spaces where a quality of voices are shared, 
uh, not, you know, teachers versus consultants or consultants versus leaders or anything like that, but getting people all on the same level playing field, public, private, independent schools, whatever you want to call it, getting everyone speaking as teachers and equals rather than any hierarchical system that we might replicate. And so collaboration and coaching, trusting teachers in groups. Um, to me, the core distinction is andragogy and pedagogy. If you're not familiar with those words, pedagogy is leading children, andragogy is leading men. Again, that's inverted commas because that's you know, di dictionary definition stuff. And so basically empowering teachers as adults, giving them choice, giving them impact on what they can do rather than treating them as you would a class of students in rows, taking turns, hands up, anything like that. Um, strange one for, for you. I think there's certainly some scope for media training of some teachers. Uh, I mean, if you just think something like, oh, well, Q&A, let's say there's never enough teachers on there, or if there are, they're always the same individuals that we all know and love. Um, but then if someone turned around and said, well, would you like to speak? And uh, most people would likely say no. So there's space for expert panels and media training as ways for teachers to find their voice within different fora, different groups, different forums. And then as we're doing right now, find your voice, then promote another. So I, I spent all of my university years, which are, were more than most people's university years, let's say, because I continued doing it until very recently. Um, I've got everything but a PhD, I like to say. Uh, essentially, I was always talking about teacher voice. We need to hear teacher's voice. Um, but I didn't realize that that would then come back around to me and people might actually ask me what I thought and therefore you are beholden to hand that and pass that off to other people so that they may speak as well. And so I've got 36 seconds remaining. This is going considerably well timing wise. So the basic concept is you empower teachers, which is both a systemic and an individual task. Then you democratize schooling and so doing you empower students. So that is, you know, in any flow chart in education, you need to end up with empowering the students or improving the lives of students. And I'm just taking a circuitous or roundabout route, starting with the teachers, letting them impact their classrooms, and then empowering students. And I'm going to stop my alarm so we're done on time. But that is the concept. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Thank you, Stephen. You do so much work to empower teachers and students through Teachers Across Borders. You run so many teach meets um, and you even engage teachers in you know, research through Twitter. So I'm very excited to help you bring your book to life. I, I'll try to get it in by the deadline. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Now we have Jim Knight. He's the founding senior partner of the Instructional Coaching Group and a senior research associate at the University of Kansas Center for research on learning. His, the title of his presentation is What is Instructional Coaching? Now he is from America, it is quite early and he does have a young child, so he's actually pre-recorded his presentation for us today. While I get that up, um, feel free to just spend a minute just in the chat box um, if you have any questions, you know, after listening to Victoria and Steve's uh, presentations, feel free to pop any questions in and I'm sure they wouldn't mind um, answering. Hi everyone, grateful to Steffi for the chance to say hi to Australia. It's my first year, I haven't gone there in about 10 years and I'm missing it. Still start every day with Vegemite though, just so you know, so I feel I've got my Australia credit. And looking forward to the AFL season. A little bit of my Australia connection. I wanted to explain today a little bit about what instructional coaching is and kind of distinguish it from other kinds of coaching. I just make it really quick, and I'm going to borrow a uh, diagram from John Campbell and Christian Van Uerberg. And this is the basic diagram. They say that uh, coaching involves a way of being, a process, and some coaching skills. And I want to talk about that with respect to instructional coaching to distinguish it from other models. I want to make it clear, I'm not suggesting that instructional coaching is superior. I just think that different models of coaching have different places they can be used. And instructional coaching serves a different purpose than, say, growth coaching or cognitive coaching. 
So what is it we mean when we talk about instructional coaching? Well, the first thing is that uh, like growth coaching or cognitive coaching or other forms of coaching, there's a set of beliefs that guide the interactions of coaches, a way of being. Um, the term I first heard from Christian, and I think he probably got it from Carl Rogers, and it's been around for some time, but the basic idea are what are the beliefs that guide my behavior? When I um, talk about instructional coaching, we talk about the partnership approach. In fact, that was my dissertation research. We saw that the partnership approach uh, was four and a half times more powerful in terms of leading to implementation than a more directive top-down approach. You can find that paper on the website, instructionalcoaching.com. But for us, uh, that idea of a partnership is that we position ourselves as equals with the person we work with. And in fact, if anything, the person we're collaborating with has more power than us. The way we put it is that the teacher sits in the big chair, we sit in the little chair. That's, that's our way of being. Second thing is a coaching process or process. I'm living in the States, but I'm from Canada, so I, I, I move back and forth with my language. Process, process. Um, but there's some kind of process. And so if it's growth coaching, it would follow the growth process of goals, reality, options, will, tactics and habits, but we have a different process and that's what we call the impact cycle. So I have another diagram for that. The impact cycle looks like this. You identify a clear picture of current reality and then a goal and then a strategy. It kind of inverts the way coaching is. Often coaching starts with a goal, but we feel you can't really get a goal until you know what reality has to show you. And most of us don't have a very clear picture of reality. Once we've got a goal that matters to the teacher, it's going to make a difference for kids. It's powerful, emotionally compelling, and it's reachable. And then, uh, then you're ready to go and you move to the second part, which is, excuse me, over here, learn. In the learning stage, we get the teacher in partnership with the coach. The two of them get ready to implement the strategy. And so that often means we have to describe something really precisely, make adaptations. The teacher gets a chance to see it somewhere. But at the end of the learning stage, the teacher should know what they're going to do. And they should be ready to go. And the third thing is improve. Now we make adaptations until we hit the goal. And so maybe we change the strategy. Maybe we change the goal. Maybe we just wait, but we keep making adaptations if necessary until we get there. So a teacher might look at video of her class, realize the kids aren't that engaged, set an engagement goal, pick a strategy like changing their questioning. Then the coach talks about different kinds of questioning. Maybe we go watch another teacher, watch a video. Teacher's ready to go. She implements the questioning. It sort of works, but there have to be some adaptations, and they keep working till they hit the goal. That's the, that's the process. Third thing. Is coaching skills. And essentially, an instructional coach would have similar skills to other coaches. That largely means they're really good listeners and really good questioners. Now, listening and questioning are to coaching like skating is to hockey. You really need to know what you're talking about in terms of being a good listener and a good coach, and a good listener and a good questioner. And so that's the deal there. There are certain skills a coach has to have. It's pretty hard to be an effective coach if you can't listen well and you're not really a good questioner. But fortunately, those are learnable skills. The easiest way to learn it is to watch yourself in a video. Now, here's where we differ a little bit from other models of coaching. And that is that an instructional coach has strategic knowledge. Now, when the coach has time, and when appropriate, this is really effective. And that strategic knowledge is the coach knows how to gather data, and the coach understands effective teaching practices. We call that an instructional playbook. They have a repertoire of powerful teaching practices they share. That's the strategic knowledge. Now, in many cases, the instructional coach starts out in the facilitative realm and never has to go to strategic knowledge. But if the teacher isn't sure what to do, and if the teacher doesn't know how to gather data, then the coach can say, would it be okay with you if I shared some of the things I'm thinking with respect to this? And uh, they don't ever make the decision for the teacher. They always position the teacher as the decision maker, but they say, here's something I'm wondering, what do you think about this? And it has to become really clear that the coach is not taking sides, not trying to talk the teacher into something, or just putting a suggestion out there so that if helpful, they can do it. Now, a facilitative approach to coaching where coaches don't share knowledge is really helpful when the teacher knows or whoever's being coached has the knowledge and they just need someone to help them get clear on their goals, to make a plan, 
as John and Christian say, to facilitate action and clarity and uh, a real sense of moving forward. The, um, this approach, the instructional coaching approach, is really helpful when the person doesn't have the knowledge or skills to need to move forward, or when you're just trying to integrate a, a body of literature around effective instruction. Billions of dollars has been spent on what in fact, in fact, effective instruction looks like, and it would be silly not to actually use that material. And that's instructional coaching. It's a way of being, the partnership approach, a process, the impact cycle, skills, largely listening and questioning, and strategic knowledge, which is about the teaching strategies and the data that's gathered by the coach. All right, so that was Jim Knight, and I'm thankful to Jim um, for sharing that presentation with us. I think the instructional coaching model is so impactful. Um, I've seen such a shift in um, the culture at my school when we implemented the instructional coaching model. And it really started with my principal um, coaching me um, and then allowing me to coach her uh, and watch her teach. And um, it does create that relationship, that, that, um, that connection um, and, you know, that space to just pause and, and just talk about teaching and learning and what their students need. So if you haven't looked into instructional coaching um, yet as a school, I highly encourage you to do so. So now we have Barbara Reynolds, who is a critical friend who works with many inspirational primary schools in Sydney, Australia. The title of her presentation is Empowering Others Minute by Minute, Day by Day. Thanks so much, Steffi. Oh my goodness gracious, oh, here we go. Um, thank you so much. Empowering students, empowering teachers. I think this is actually the, the topic for the moment. I think this should be our priorities in our schools right at the moment. I want to start by uh, sharing two images. On the left hand side, I have my eldest granddaughter, Charlotte. Charlotte was in year six last year and she was elected the school captain. It, this year was going to be, that year was going to be the highlight of her, of her school career. Then came the pandemic, the lockdown, the, the structures that isolated students and parents and teachers from each other. And Charlotte's year went to mud. She wasn't able to find a leadership role for herself in, in the changed circumstances. She wasn't able to create new ways of doing things. She didn't have the media skills that might have enabled her to do that. She lost confidence that her voice was important and she, she gradually lost her social connections. Charlotte's year went to mud. She, Charlotte's now going on to high school uh, and she's feeling quite disempowered. She's feeling more anxious than she would have been. She's not as confident that she can reconnect socially. She's lost a lot of the wonder that she has and the passion that she has for learning. I think there are many, many Charlottes in our schools today. The pandemic has had a lasting effect, or, or not a lasting effect, but, but quite a significant impact on the way our students are today. On the right hand side are teachers that I worked with 15 years ago. And every year our teachers meet up, we meet up together, and these are joyful occasions. And just recently we met up, having skipped last year, and it was a joyful occasion. And it was a joyful occasion until the time came that we started to talk about how, the, how things were going in teachings in all their many different settings. And what the teachers were saying was that they are feeling disenchanted, they're feeling frustrated, they're feeling overworked. They're seeing their role now as, as a huge amount of paperwork, that accountability has replaced support within our system. They're seeing that they worked so hard last year during the pandemic time, but rather than being praised and rewarded, they're being criticised at a wider level. They, these teachers feel that they're losing the control over the agenda, the initiatives, not able to, to, to put in place their passions. The teachers, like Charlotte, are feeling quite disempowered. So, I work in, in many schools as uh, coordinating instructional rounds, a marvellous opportunity to see what's happening in classrooms and in schools. And so how do we move from disempowerment to empowerment? 
I guess my time in school says to me that there are three really big pillars that we need to look at. The first pillar is nurturing wonder and igniting passion. The second is about curriculum, curriculum content based on big ideas and the skills of the discipline. And the third one is about pedagogy, the way that students engage. Here's my number one. I think this is, is the priority for the moment. Nurturing wonder and igniting passion is the title of our New South Wales curriculum review. But I think it's really time for us to reconnect, to connect with the heart as well as the minds of both our students and of our teachers. With our students, at this time as they're coming back into our schools, I think we really need to make the time to get to know them. What is it that they're passionate about? What are their hopes for the future? What are the skills that they have? What are the cultural backgrounds and experiences that they bring? Let's tap into the passions of those students by spending the time to get to know them better. For our teachers as well, I think it's time to re-engage the heart, to, to think back, what is my moral purpose? Why am I here? What brings me joy? What excites passion? What do I wonder about? I think for our teachers, uh, we need to set aside time to put this as a priority for us. Put some signs in your room, make lists of things to do, but start on those lists with the things that for you ignite passion and nurture wonder. Put the other things to a side until you've re-established that connection with teaching and learning. So my, my second pillar is curriculum content. And I, I, this is so, so important. Um, as a learner, is today's learning going to help me understand the big ideas that I can build on year after year? Am I learning the skills of the discipline? It's so easy to get caught in the nitty gritties, to digress into learning that can be um, on occasions trivial uh, if we're not careful. It's time to go back to those front pages in our curriculum documents and say, what is the learning that's going to, that these students are going to be able to carry on year after year that's going to empower them? What, how do we uh, have the skills? How do we encourage students to write like writers, um, learn science like scientists? How do we ensure that they have the reasoning skills of the discipline that are going to in, in, ensure that they can continue learning and think and act like an expert. And the third pillar is pedagogy, students at the centre. And we've touched on some of this. From the student's perspective, have you considered them? Is my voice important in the classroom? Do I get a chance to construct knowledge with others? Do I know that you've high, got high expectations of me? Do I have power? Do I get some say in what I learn? Do I get some say in how I'm assessed? And does this learning tap into my skills, my backgrounds, my experiences? Is the learning authentic? So I think we need to move from disempowerment to empowerment. Oh, but all of those three aspects are important. If we have the two on the right hand side without the wonder and passion, we risk having a, a major loss of emotional connection. If we have the two on the outside but forget the curriculum, we are at risk of having learning that's trivial. And if we have the two on the left hand side without the pedagogy, we may have learning that's shallow and a loss of autonomy for our students. How do we do it? It's not in big projects, big commitments. It's changes that occur minute by minute, day by day. And as, as a person going into schools, looking at instructional rounds uh, on a regular basis, I have an instructional rounds mindset that says, if I'm going to make those changes, what would I observe in your setting? What would the learners be doing and saying? What would the teachers be doing and saying? And what will be the qualities of the task? This is the lens that I think we should be looking at as we work in our classrooms and with our professional learning. And there is one big idea. If you're the fly on the wall and you're looking down at that learning, the one big idea that we have is from Richard Elmore from Harvard University. If I'm the fly on the wall and I can't see those three pillars, I can't see the students at the center, I can't see the curriculum. If you can't see it, it's not there. I just finish by saying, I'm working a lot with students and teachers. I think this is the time. 
we need to empower, we need to re-empower both our students and our teachers. Thank you, Barbara, for sharing your story and even your granddaughter's story with us today. Um, you, I know that you do so much important work to give voice to our teachers and that you support schools in making these sustainable changes for students. Uh, thank you for reminding us to re-engage the hearts of students to nurture wonder and ignite passion. And you've done great with the technology, Barb. Well done. <laughs> so next we have all the way from the UK, Simon Brooks, teaching and learning consultant who is working with schools around the world through Simon Brooks Education. He's also returned back to teaching. He's a senior school English teacher now at Hereford Cathedral School in the UK, which is apparently the oldest school in the UK. And the title of his presentation is Creating Cultures of Thinking, Seven Powerful Questions to Ask Ourselves and Our Students. Take it away, Simon. Thank you, Steffi. And of course, what a joy to be here today. And thank you for the opportunity to speak alongside all of these wonderful other speakers as well. I've been learning so much listening along, so I hope everybody's enjoying themselves. So let's kick off my seven minutes. And I'm here today to put my particular spin on this notion of empowering teachers to empower students through the lens of creating cultures of thinking. And cultures of thinking for folks who might not know is an approach to teaching and learning that emerges from work from Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And in my work with schools, I help schools around the world who are interested to build cultures of thinking. I thought I'd set myself the um, possibly overly ambitious challenge today of seven minutes, so seven questions. I really want this to be practical as best that this can be for the people who have tuned in today. So I'm thinking about sharing with you seven powerful questions that we might ask ourselves as educators and our students if we're interested in, in the notion of building a culture of thinking and in doing so, empowering those students to grow as learners and thinkers. I hope that's okay. That's what I'm doing anyway. So I'm going to plow on and share with you question number one which arguably is probably the most important question in all education, which is what do we want the children that we teach to be like when they're adults? Such a great starting point for us all to give ourselves that sort of big picture sense of, a, of an approach to education so that we're not lost in the specifics of what we teach, but thinking more about their dispositional growth and the type of people that we want them to become long after we've finished teaching them and they've left school. Here are some of the types of responses that teachers come up with when I ask them this question. And really that's the Cultures of Thinking project in a nutshell. So we're interested in putting thinking front and center in service of developing these types of dispositions in our students. So I wonder what type of disposition that you're interested in nurturing in your students. Another great question that we can ask our students to try to unpack some of this puzzle is this one. For us to ask them, what do you think is important to me as your teacher? So if you've got older students, just ask them that question, get them to jot it down on paper, collect it in, see what comes up. For younger students, maybe facilitate some little focus groups around that question. And it's interesting to see what surfaces. Sometimes um, when I've asked this question of some of my classes, I've been a tad horrified with their responses when they see, say things like, it's important to Mr. Brooks that homework is submitted on time, or that we line up silently outside class before invited in. And of course, nothing wrong with those things, but those are behavioral things, our expectations of them. But this question is great to try to surface what expectations they think we have for them. Like, will they write things like, it's important to Mr. Brooks, or insert teacher's name, that we justify everything that we say, that we ask questions. It's important that we make connections between what we're learning now and what we learned yesterday. We don't know what messages we're sending about what's important until we ask. So I challenge folks listening today to ask this question of their students. If you want to have a playful variant, how about this one? What is it that you hear me saying repeatedly, my students? What's that thing that you hear me saying over and over 
and over again. Our words have power and the words that we say regularly build the culture that our students then step into. So what are the things that we're saying over and over again? Actually, um, I asked one of my classes this week this que question and I just thought I'd share quickly some of the response, in fact, all of the responses that they came up with. And we won't go through all of these right now, but it was really interesting for me to surface them. I'm hoping that that fourth one down, by the way, is not something that they hear me saying every lesson, you know, sort of stuttering in the corner about the fact that I can't think of anything to do here. But it's interesting that the word they've highlighted, the word powerful is something I say a lot that comes up a lot. And they're also starting to pick up on some of the questions and statements that I make regularly. So let's zoom into a couple of those now as questions that we might ask our students every day. I'm working on asking any questions less. And what are you wondering more? Really connecting here to what Barbara was saying before about nurturing wonder and igniting passion. It's so easy, particularly when you're teaching um, virtually or remotely, as I've been doing, to fall into this trap of saying, any questions about the task? But what would it be like if I asked that a bit less? And what are you wondering more? Another thing I'm working on in an ongoing sense is to say anything else less and what else more? So if students are engaged in ideation and I say anything else, I'm giving permission for there to be nothing. In fact, sometimes I'm trying to silence them. Anything else? No, well, on we go with this thing. Whereas what else? The coach's question, connecting to Jim Knight's talk earlier, sends a message that I believe that they've got more and that they can mine it. it creates an expectation for more thoughts. And of course, the sixth question I'll share with you today that I continue to work on is this question, what makes you say that? A thinking routine. In fact, this question of all the interventions I know is the most powerful way to build a culture which is focused on thinking and learning in our classroom. We all say it, but what would it be like if we say it more often? What would it be like if tomorrow is what makes you say that day where you set yourself the challenge of saying it as much as you possibly can? What shift in classroom culture might you notice if you do so? We say what makes you say that a lot to build that culture of justification because we believe that learning is a consequence of thinking. And if we're interested in putting learning front and center, then we've got to put thinking front and center to do so. My seventh and final question then for us to ask ourselves on a daily basis as educators is if we're putting think in front and center, then how did my students surprise me with their thinking today? What thinking did they do that made me have that unexpected reaction? If they don't surprise me, maybe that means I didn't give them enough opportunities to think. Maybe it was too much about me and not enough about them. So this is a question to challenge ourselves with on a daily basis and then in due course, create more opportunities for thinking to be front and center. Let's finish. I've got through my seven questions, but let's finish with a bonus question to ask ourselves every day. Um, sometimes the best thing that we can ask ourselves is, why am I talking? How can I stop talking so that they can think more? When can I pull back so that the learning shifts to them? And it's definitely time for me to ask myself that question now. Why am I talking? Time to finish. Thank you, folks. Back to Steffi. Thank you, Simon. Um, you gave us so many great questions that I think will really help empower students and make sure that we're giving them opportunities to think deeply. Um, questions like, what makes you say that? What is it that you hear me saying over and over again? Definitely a question I'd be nervous to ask, but I actually am curious to ask. So thank you so much, Simon, you're very wise. And again, you do so much uh, important work with schools and at John Purchase, we're lucky to have you uh, for the, I think, third or fourth year now. Um, you've empowered so many teachers and students to think deeply. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Steffi.
And now our finale, we have Summer Howarth, the founder and learning designer at the Eventful Learning Co. The title of her presentation is From Agency to Empowerment, How Policy is Shifting Because of Our Students and Their Voice. Thank you so much, Steffi. Um, and just reiterating pay my respects to the elders on the land in which I'm presenting on and which you are learning from today. My name is Summer and I was one of the people who was at one of the very first teach meets and this is probably my first one in, oh my goodness, I want to say five or six years. Um, love to connect with you on Twitter and across the socials as well. So when we're talking about this idea of agency and empowerment, it's all good and well, but we need to have those conditions for it to go somewhere and to really push the needle on change. So it was actually only today that the Relationships Project that's out of the UK released a little bit of a study of observations of policy change from the first 100 days of lockdown. This is an interesting little timer or little uh, you know, gauge that they came up with here. Sort of saying beforehand, attitudes and behaviours of citizens in general um, are sitting there on the left hand side. We found through a shared um, understanding of what sort of happened in the pandemic and trying to navigate through, we're actually finding that attitudes and behaviours in general are going to more trusting, more enabling, cooperating, personified and your what ifs. And I think Barbara said it really well, that there's opportunities here, particularly for us in the teaching profession, to really think about what might this mean for a shift in behaviours of our community, but also public policy. When we start to talk about, well, what is agency, it definitely can be thought of in a, a spectrum. So there are degrees of it which are from silence to shared decision making. And Roger Hart has really led the work around this alongside Dr. Tanya Vaughan recently, who has been working with me, particularly up in the Northern Territory, thinking around how student agency really goes on that spectrum to empowerment and how it now is embedded in policy and a bit of a ministerial direction through there as well. Meaning that we have created the conditions that the enabling environments are making decisions based on the voices and choices of young people. So, you know, that might think it's, it's a bit of a pipe dream. I wanted to give you a little bit of the tangible hows this had happened. And while there are certain things that we can do today in our classrooms, such as this, really look at how we nicely design in voice and choice and responsibility, it's a long pathway to get it to something that changes whole systems. So Chris Hart and I did some work across lockdown here in Victoria, where we worked with hundreds of teachers online. We worked with the Vic SRC, who were really pivotal in putting lots of their research on the table, as were pivot uh, surveys. And what we said was actually empowerment comes through agency. That was our big finding there. So it's a bit of a taxonomy. So if you think of this as a little bit of a menu or a recipe, how might you embed this at all levels of your school from classroom practice, perhaps through to co-curricular, student leadership, um, and even leadership of our staff as well. We co-design this alongside some student voice advocates who actually are students in classrooms across Victoria right now. And I wanted to share this. I, I think that it is broader than online and remote settings, but Chris Hart and I came up with these sort of five keys to empowering learners, that we need to have the presence of trust. And we know you can't just say trust, obviously it has to be activated through a lot of shared experiences there. Consistency came up. Now it might be a consistency in our messaging, it's a consistency in us uh, promising, uh, delivering on what we promise. There are many ways that we can put consistency in without it just becoming you know, a boring all the time the same thing that we need actual structures in place through schools and through systems. And uh, that includes some of those structures that we put in place for student leaders and what they are enabled to do. Safety is really key. This was particularly key for online as well. You can see how when things are safe, you've got the structures for safety, consistent protocols, which builds trust. They all link in together here, but safety, psychological safety, personal safety, in every manner that we mean that, we need to be able to put that into place so that learners are taking that off the table. It's a simple Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of uh, concept there. And of course, space and opportunity. This is a key one that I wanted to talk about and share with you today. We need to create some space and opportunity for voice, 
choice and responsibility to actually come to fruition. So really looking at Roger Hart's work, uh, we simplified it down. We think that if you have a structure that is a ladder of student empowerment, and of course this can apply to anybody working in a school, but let's focus in on students. We go from voice to agency by making our way up the ladder. Simply, there are things that we can do to, for, and with students. Gonski said as number three recommendation that students need to be partners. Here are a couple of real life examples here. Amy O'Toole, she is a partner in research. When she was 15, um, she gave a TED talk. She was 12 at the time. Um, she was working with Bo Lotto, um, who is a behavioral scientist on a project with B. So she was the youngest peer reviewed researcher and published. Um, that was a very significant turning point in her love of science. You've got Ella Simons here. Ella is a student from Victoria. She uh, founded the School Strike for Climate, and this is her speaking to over uh, a couple of hundred, I think it is, um, a startup and business CEOs talking about how you rally people around a brand. So she is a partner in Solution. You have Music Industry College led by the brilliant Brett Wood. What he has done is enable the space and opportunity for alumni students. As you can see here, Ash Jeffrey, she was Triple J unearthed, I think in 2018. And with current students, they actually cover each other's songs. It's 100% student created content. It's the, the space that has been created for that voice agency um, to be embedded. And of course, there's the Northern Territory Learning Commission. We've got students here who are taking their school's data, they are finding some pain points, they're coming up with solutions, and they are pitching what should happen next to, uh, for learning in, this, in the territory. You can see John Hattie is there, you can see Aitzel, GM, and um, we've got some of these young learners who were asking if they knew what qualitative and quantitative data was all about. So it's a pretty exciting piece of work there. I encourage you to follow along with the Northern Territory Learning Commission. It's that now embedded in um, our Alice Springs declaration with student voice. So this is true for teachers as well. Voice, choice and responsibility. How might you actually move students and yourself up that ladder of empowerment to make sure that you truly are co-designing learning, learning experiences and the experience of school so that you can redesign education. And because if for no other reason, growing student agency can help individuals <laughs> to overcome technical adversities such as alarms going off. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share that great work, Steffi. The big one thing there that you can see is we are starting from a base of great people, great projects who have led the way, um, including so many people who are in the audience here today. Thank you, Summer. And I'm just knowing you, I know that you're always about changing the narrative, seeing the positive, building on like awesome schools, and teachers and students are just doing. So I love that you highlight like great work across, yeah, across schools. So thank you for choosing to return to Teach Meets tonight and choosing this Teach Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've definitely helped me think about how if we want to see student empower and agency, student empowerment and agency, then we need to work on how we build our teacher agency as well. So thank you so much. So I was so happy I chose you to wrap thank things up for us. Honor. All right, so we do have four minutes left for some Q&A, so I'm jumping onto the chat. And we have Max, a new teacher with us tonight. Welcome, Max. He would love to hear from Barbara or any presenters, um, ideally someone who relates to new teachers. Um, how do you maintain your own wonder and passion for teaching? Barbara, did you want to come I'll, in? I'll just say very quickly, look, I, I think it is about um, developing yourself a network at any stage in your career so as a new teacher look around you find those people who've got some common interests with you and find times to meet with them to talk with them and find a network of people that you can engage with over a long period of time I think that's the main one I think for me again I think I've developed my values very slowly over a long career they weren't they weren't fully embedded you know when I when I started off it was the experiences that I've undertaken through, throughout my career that helped me develop those values and that helped for, for me to drive my passion. Thanks, Bob. Did anyone else want to add anything? 
Well, I can just say I must agree with Barbara on that. The connections that I made as a first year teacher and just getting with like minded people and connecting with them, learning and growing together. That is really what helped me when I started when I started out. So definitely make those connections. Thank you, ladies. Um, we have a question here now from, I think, Kathy or Ruth from AXA. How do we ensure the gems we discovered during 2020 and the pandemic in relation to school structure online learning are not lost? I'd love to have a go at that one, Steffi. I, you've got to have um, some structures in place. I truly believe that you have to build this into the timetable. I think it's your biggest lever for change. Um, and it's really looking at what are some of those opportunities for you to continue on with some of those remote learning structures to build that sort of trust and um, those skill base and the authenticity. So look for different ways to maybe restructure your parent teacher interviews, perhaps even during the day, perhaps while students work remotely could just be an idea. But yes, we need to hold on to all of those things that worked really well. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you, Summer. Simon, this is a fun one for you. What's your favourite thinking routine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's like asking somebody who their favourite child is, I think. I'm not entirely sure it's okay to answer it. Um, if I was going to talk about favourite thinking routine, I probably would go with Connect Extend Challenge. So that's a really, really powerful thinking routine for ensuring that learners think about how what they're being exposed to now connects with what they've already learned before. Um, it also has them think about how what they're learning now is pushing and extending their learning forward. So it enables them to be present in that experience of understanding how I'm moving forward in result of what I'm doing in this moment. Plus, it's all about putting that wonder back out there that many of us have been talking about today. And if we're going to have more opportunities for children to be wondering, to engage in wonder, then we need to consciously craft opportunities which put children in the position of being able to surface their wondering. Wondering doesn't just happen unless we create opportunities for it to emerge. Thanks, Simon. And I think with that, we're just going to wrap up to this evening. I just like to, would like to say thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. I hope you're feeling empowered to share some of these ideas uh, with others and even more motivated to make a difference um, for our students. Thank you for attending and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Guy. Thank you to our presenters. Amazing. It was nice meeting everyone. Thank you. Are you going to go do a workout, Victoria? I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm up now. I'll go to